All right. So without further ado, we'll get some. I think we all had plenty of good audio earlier, right? Um, first person I want to bring out here, uh, the writer and director of this movie, Christopher Nolan. We have the uh, author of the book that this movie was based off uh, that's called American uh, Prometheus, Kai Bird. One of the honorary chairs of this event, a Nobel Prize winner, and one of the people that taught Christopher Physics here uh, from Caltech, Dr. Kip Thorne. The current director of the Los Alamos National Laboratory, who is sitting in the job, Mr. Oppenheimer, Dr. Oppenheimer sat in, Dr. Tom Mason. And we have the other tutor of physics for Mr. Nolan here, whose books, uh, Christopher tells me, uh, are just fantastic. Uh, another honorary agent, a world-renowned theoretical physicist, Dr. Carlo Rovelli of Ex Marseille. All right. Christopher thinks he's going to get the first question, but he's not. Kai gets the first question. It's his book. You get to be the first critic here. How did he do? How did it come port with your portrayal? How did it, how do you feel as if the character you wrote about and researched and how did he portray him? Well, I, I first want to say that I just wish Marty Sherwin was here, my co-author on the book, who would have been blown away. It was, you know, Marty worked on this book for 25 years and uh when we learned from Christopher that he was doing this, uh, it was it was welcome news. But we were skeptical, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Well, because it's a it's a complicated seven hundred page book, and uh, and then I had a meeting with Christopher, and he explained what he was doing. And I came back and reported to Marty and uh, reassured him that I thought that this was actually something special mm -hmm. and real. And then he died two weeks later. Wow. Um, but he would have been just overwhelmed and pleased with what you've done. It's a brilliant um, artistic creation, and it's faithful to the book. Uh, that. Thank you. That, that's what I wanted to hear. That's what I wanted to hear. I, I was going to say, I assume you did too. There's nothing I love more as somebody who consumes a book than to sit there and watch the movie and criticize it. Um, <laughs> So, Christopher, why did you feel this movie needed to be made? I, I, there was a great story. You talked about your own kids, and they were, they were going, oh, why do we have to worry about nuclear weapons anymore? And this was before, the, before Russia invaded Ukraine. Uh, and then your response was, well, this is why I have to make the movie. Yeah, and, and sadly, with everything that's happening in the world right now, no, no one's asking that question anymore. Um, but to me, you know, there were two answers to that. You know, you know one is maybe that's a reason to make, make the film. Mm -hmm. um, but the other is that the story itself, uh, particularly as found in, in American Prometheus, the story of Robert Oppenheimer's life, and obviously in particular his relationship with the Manhattan Project, but his entire life, involves some of the most dramatic elements I've ever encountered in, in anybody's story, fictional or, or, or real. And so for me... Everything really was about wanting to dive into his head, you know, really try and live his experience with him. And, and in that way, you know, when I talk to everybody, Killy and everybody involved with the film is, you know, we're trying to keep people in his point of view and in that way achieve understanding rather than judgment. Mm -hmm. And the hope is that by achieving that and going through the story that way, you sort of leave the film with some unsettling questions and some, some troubling issues. I'm going to, right before you probably heard me say, and I said, you know, it's okay, I think, if you feel this anxiety. I felt a ton of anxiety uh, after watching the film. And as I sh shared with you, the same anxiety I go home uh, from work every day with about our current political situation, our current state of our democracy, I felt that after watching this movie, and I assume that's exactly what you want. 
yeah, I mean, I think the the idea of of addressing this story, firstly, as simple dramatic experience, um, it's a, it's a tricky word to use with a movie to say entertainment. But the thing about cinema, the thing about a dramatic film, as opposed to a documentary, um, is it's about engagement and it's about trying to give the audience an experience. And my feeling was that the experience of his life, the experience of, of what these events were, and trying to understand, trying to feel what it must have been like to be in these incredibly paradoxical situations mm -hmm. would lead you to a place where you realise that we have tremendously troubling questions left at the end of it. And the film does not pretend to offer any easy answers. I mean, the reality is, as a filmmaker, I don't have to offer the answers. I just mm -hmm. get to ask the most interesting questions. Um, and a, But I do think there's tremendous value in that if it can resonate with the audience, you know, after they've seen it. Tom Mason, you run Los Alamos now. I'm curious, the Los Alamos scenes in the movie, how familiar did it feel? What's, what's there today that would be familiar to us if we showed up there? Well, I actually recognized a few faces in some of the <laughs> scenes because there was a period in March where a large number of my staff were on vacation uh, working as extras on the film. Uh, <laughs> but, Good game. you know, Los Alamos in New, northern New Mexico is a very special place. Uh, I mean, it's it's a dramatic place for dramatic events, and and I think you saw some of that in the in the in the scenery in the film, um, and you know, there's um, the audience may not be aware of it, but certainly Christopher is. Uh, a lot of the buildings that were used, Oppenheimer House, is the same Oppenheimer House. Remarkably, although it was sold after the war, it was essentially unchanged. And the woman who owned it passed away a couple of years ago. Fuller Lodge, uh, you know, is is there. There's actually a Manhattan Project National Historic Park, and uh, mm -hmm. so it was it was for me fascinating to see these historic sites come alive, uh, you know, and come come alive in a way where, you know, these are images that I kn I know, you know, I see them every day, and pre before I was. At Los Alamos, I was in Oak Ridge, and, mm -hmm. you know, the story of the birth of those institutions is really important to all the people who work there. And uh, that's something that you could see, really see reflected, mm -hmm. both in the, in the scenery and the faces of the people who inhabited the space. Well, it gave us the most knowledgeable extras we've ever had. I mean, <laughs> this, this scene where Oppenheimer comes in the back of, of the meeting, yeah. and I was saying to the the extras not really thinking about where they were from. You know, well, if you could all be arguing about, you know, the shift in geopolitical tension, you know, the use of the bomb, is it going to be used against Germany? But now we're talking about Japan. Mm -hmm. Could you just, you know, start shouting out, you know, whatever. And, and normally, you know, you're saying to a group, it's sort of rhubarb, 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 you know, murmur, murmur, murmur. <laughs> and, and we were hearing the most precise. <laughs> if you do this, it's it, going to be... Yeah, and it was very, uh, and some very passionate about it. I mean, they really, really got into it. And and the truth is, it was wonderful because it sort of put us all on our toes. Same at the GAC meeting. We had a couple of guys at that table who, they knew a lot about mm. what we were talking about. And, you know, it gave you confidence because you had people there who knew right. knew what you were doing, um, but it kept you on your toes as well. Well, I was just going to say, let's grade him on the on the science, Kip uh, and, and and Carlo. Um, how's your student here? How did he do with the physics, uh, Kip Thorne? I think he did superbly well, mm -hmm. as he always does. <laughs> I, I worked with him very closely on Interstellar, and mm -hmm. uh, I, I, among all the people I've worked with in Hollywood. He understands more science, I think, having learned it uh, by browsing the web <laughs> than anybody else except Anne Hathaway. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, actually, um, you just saw the movie, and I'm still under the, 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 the spell of the movie. So first thing, I think, um, Christopher, I think you did a masterpiece. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm strongly um, affected by the movie. I think it's wonderful. Um, Chuck, allow me to say that I, I think everybody should see this movie, because uh, not only because it's fantastic, but because the, what, what it raises, the kind of questions that it raises are not just about the 40s and about uh, general issues about morality of scientists and things like that. There are questions, there are burning questions today. Um, the, 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 the doomsday clock that, uh, um, that uh, uh, is supposed to estimate the risk of nuclear catastrophe has never been closer to, to, to midnight. So we are in a situation in which the kind of concerns um, that Oppenheimer was expressing it in this confused way uh, are, are our concerns today. And I think this is what the movie brings out so strongly. And Oppenheimer, who keeps saying international cooperation is right. the only way out, uh, seems to me a message that at least we should discuss more and more in a situation in which it seems that all the countries are going the opposite direction. Instead of looking for international cooperation, um, so much of international politics is about prevailing against one another, being leading the world, being the, one, the, the, the winning one against the other. And the risk of a catastrophe is, is, is enormous. So I think the intensity of the movie is also because, uh, um, because it touches a, a, a real risk, which is, which, is, which is now. And this image is in which um, Oppenheimer himself sees his friend being sort of burned alive. I think you talk to all of that and make us think. And that's why I think we should all see this movie. Uh, let me just add one thing about the science. <clears throat> it's not just simply the uh, science itself, but the scientific process that uh, Chris has captured so beautifully. The, the central issue that it comes out in, the, in your book and then in the movie very strongly of, of the contrast between the security system that needs compartmentalization mm -hmm. and doing the science and doing the science successfully and doing the science quickly, right. which requires openness. It requires that people working on different aspects of the problem communicate mm -hmm. about what they're working on because uh, uh, what this person is doing in that area will influence what happens with this person in this area. And if you, if you have compartmentalization, you're dead. You're, it'll take, take far, far longer. And, and this comes out very nicely in the movie. It's, it, and that, in some ways, understanding that is in some ways more important than understanding the science, that understanding the, mm -hmm. the scientific process and how right. it works. Talk about, I mean, you, you portrayed that. What, what was the hardest part of portraying the science? What was your biggest challenge and, what, and, and what, how did you sure. think was the best way to attack it? Well, uh, the hardest part was, you know, I, I visited the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton to see about filming there. And indeed, they, they did very generously let us film there mm -hmm. in Einstein's office and, and the real pond that, that mm -hmm. you know, they would walk by. Um, but the, the then director, Robert Digraph, uh, another brilliant physicist who could sit on this panel, and, <laughs> uh, he, he very generously gave me some of his time mm -hmm. to talk about, okay, quantum physics, talk about the, these things, the revolutionary nature of what Oppenheimer was visualizing because I wanted to jump in his head and and see these things and feel them to have some kind of almost threat to them, that he's, he's almost having visions, put it that way, in order to make it clear to the audience the revolutionary mm -hmm. and almost magical nature of this shift from classical physics mm -hmm. to, to quantum physics. And, and in talking to, uh, to Robert, he immediately said, well, of course, one of the things that scientists at the time found alienating about this shift mm -hmm. is you can no longer visualize the atom. Now, to a filmmaker who's about to try and film the Yeah, I was just going to say, you can't visualize it. Exactly. Uh, then it's how, a visual medium. Exactly. <laughs> right. So what do I do? So he, he generously gave me a couple of hours. He was sort of sat there and talked about it. And in the end, you know, in talking it through with him, we sort of realized that, that the advantage that cinema has is, I mean, Eisenstein referred to it in, in editing many years ago as shot A plus shot B gives you thought C. So, you know, it could be more, the thought could be more than the sum of its parts, the, the whole. And so I went to Andrew Jackson, my visual effects supervisor of, mm -hmm. of several films, um, showed him the script very early on and said, okay, we want to do these things without computer graphics. We want to have a thread of imagery sort of starting with these very first sort of visions 
this sense of, you know, what these guys were doing is that they were looking into dull matter and seeing energy, seeing energy that could ultimately be released in the destructive power of, of the atomic bomb. And we wanted a kind of set of experimental visuals that could create this thread of what I kept referring to as sort of scintillating or vibrating energy mm -hmm. um, that could mirror his own nervous state as well, yeah. but also show you the, the quantum physics as it manifests itself ultimately in the destructive power of the bomb. Speaking of the destructive power of the bomb, you, I, I don't know why I expect, maybe, maybe others did too, I expected to see carnage. And there is imagery. In fact, I had to, my son came with me to, to the screening and he was asking about that. I said, that's, don't you remember the charred shadow that he walked through and all that? I was explaining this to him. But you didn't hit us over the head with it. Yeah, that was clearly a choice. Why? I think really as a filmmaker, you, you can't be overly conscious about why you, you choose to do things. You have to run on instinct to a degree. Mm -hmm. But my feeling, the feeling for me as a filmmaker was very strongly that to depart from Oppenheimer's experience would betray the terms of the storytelling. And so we saw so much more, we know so much more than he did at the time. Mm -hmm. Discovering from Kai's book that he learned about the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki on the radio, the same mm -hmm. as the rest of the world. That to me was a shock. This is very intentional with this thing. movie, that this is most of the movie... And, and it is is his point of view. Yeah. And then when you're in black and white, it's in Strauss's point of view. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very sort of rigidly with the color sequences. Everything, mm -hmm. everything is his experience or my interpretation of his experience. Mm -hmm. Because as I keep keep reminding everyone, it's not a documentary. It is an interpretation. I, you know, that's that's my job. Um, and so I wanted to. Would you classify it as docudrama? No, I th I think really? it's drama. I think it's it's narrative dramatic. Filmmaking. I mm -hmm. think that whilst I do think the film is perhaps more accurate than some people might think, you know, coming to it fresh because there are sort of extraordinary things. I mean, to take one example, of, you know, when you read American Prometheus and you learn that, you know, his tutor at Cambridge, Patrick Blackett, who's the guy played by James Darcy, who mm -hmm. he tries to poison. Right. He later on is the first physicist to really write questioning. America's motives in, in dropping the bomb on Japan. Now, no screenwriter would invent that. It's far too seemingly fanciful. Right. But that's the truth. And, and the film is full of those things. And so a lot of the things, you know, when Kitty Oppenheimer is testifying, right. you know, that's from the transcript. You well, know, I was just going to say, yeah. having so much, I mean, that transcript, <clears throat> you're handed... Yeah, I mean, thousand pages. Imagine not of, having of that. Transcript. No, I can't. Right. No, and I never would have taken the project on without <laughs> Kai and Marty's in, incredible work. I mean, that mm -hmm. that gave you sort of confidence. Um, but yes, to come back to the the choices of, of what to portray or not, you know, to me, it's really about staying in his head. Mm -hmm. There's also, a, a, I would say, a recurring motif. I mean, I don't, you know, deal too much in spoilers for people who haven't seen the film if people are writing about it, but. Right. There's a lot to do with what he won't look at. There's, but a, lot my favorite There's a lot to do with him closing his eyes. My, you know? my favorite retort, though, that you said about that, you were worried about spoilers, and then you said, well, there's Google. <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> this all happened. It's not like, you know, no, it's don't a, tell anybody. Exactly. There's two bombs. It's, right? a, yeah. Strange, yeah. it's a strange thing to, to yeah. say, to talk about spoilers. But, of course, and that's why it's, it's not a drama, I mean, not a documentary or a docudrama, right. because it's the way in which, you know, you receive the story that, mm -hmm. that hopefully creates suspense, hopefully creates surprise. Kai, is Oppenheimer, was he ever happy? He doesn't, oh. I mean, I, I don't, I didn't see a happy man in this movie ever. Well, he's very intense. Uh, and mm -hmm. Killian Murphy plays him oh, just very intensely. It's, it's an amazing performance. And Robert Downey Jr., too, I think his performance and the dynamic between the two. And, I mean, you've, you've just captured that in the movie. And I, I want to make a point that Christopher, I was stunned to realize that Christopher had done his own research with regard to the testimony at the end of the movie about the, the, the mysterious scientist X who testifies against Straws, yeah. uh, Hill, Chris, Chris Hill, uh, you found that 
And I, that's the Marty, Rami Malek. Marty, uh, right, yeah, Rami that's who Malek Rami Malek plays, plays that part. Yeah. And Marty and I uh, write a little bit about the Straws hearing and how he went yeah. down to the defeat, but we didn't bother to look at the test, the confirmation transcript, and, <laughs> and Christopher did. Anyway, it, it's it's uh, it's I think an amazing performance, and and uh, he captures the. Did he ever find peace? But to answer your yeah, question, yeah. Know, was he ever happy? You know, he was happy when he was on horseback in New Mexico. Okay. He was happy when he was sailing in the Caribbean in the Saint, in Saint John, where he spent. You know, he retreated. That's where he sort the, of exiled he, to, right? He yeah. self-exiled to Saint John after that summer of 1954. He took his family on a sailing trip, and then he fell in love with Saint John and bought a piece of property down there right on the beach and built a very Spartan cabin and uh, mm-hmm. and he well he was happy there but you're, you're right it's a sort of he's a he's a tortured soul he's a tortured soul he is do you think we'll keep re-examining Oppenheimer as we as as nuclear as 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 our as our understanding of quantum physics continues as our taming of the atom continues, as our ability, if we ever get to, we're always, what, 30 years away mm-hmm. from being 30 years away with cold fusion, right, and all those things, will we continue to relitigate his legacy? I, I hope so. Um, I mean, when I talk to the leading researchers in the field of AI right now, for example, they literally refer to this right now as their Oppenheimer moment. They're looking to his story to say, okay, what are the responsibilities for scientists developing new technologies that may have unintended consequences. Do you think Silicon Valley's thinking that right now? Do you yeah. think they understand this is an Oppenheimer moment? They, I mean, they say that they do, um, and that's, <laughs> that's helpful that at least it's in the conversation, um, you know, and I, and I hope that that thought process will continue. I mean, I think I'm not saying that Oppenheimer's story offers any easy answers to, to those questions, but it at least can serve as a cautionary mm-hmm. tale. It at least could show, you know, where some of those responsibilities lie, and, and have people take a take a breath and think, okay, you know, what are what is the accountability of, of uh, you know, uh, well, the Well, I think it's also going to jumpstart a conversation about the role of scientists and the need for right. us as a society drenched in technology and science to have scientists as public intellectuals. To well, do we feel to, as if the McCarthy era just sort of do you, do you feel like Kip, you're, you're, you've crossed a couple of generations here in the scientific community? Did you do you feel like scientists sort of from the generation older than you felt that chill? What happened to Oppenheimer? And they were like, all right, maybe I won't get into the political space. I think that some of them did, mm-hmm. some didn't. I uh, I think uh, that I was much influenced this through, through my father who. Uh, he dealt with McCarthyism as a, a uh, chair of a faculty mm-hmm. in Utah at the time when we had a governor who was uh, dictating the Board of Trustees fire faculty for the left, left-wing uh, mm-hmm. uh, tendencies. So he went through this. Out and he, he had to stand up for them. He was as the chair of the faculty. So I went through this as, uh, in my own family as, mm-hmm. through him. Um, then I went on, and what I saw another aspect of this, which is quite interesting. I spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union. Mm. Uh, I had collaborations with uh, with Yakov Borisovich Zeldovich, who, who, with Andrei Sakharov, was regarded as the father of the Soviet hydrogen bomb. Right. And uh, the and if you asked your R- Russian colleagues, why did you build the bomb for Stalin? Stalin was obviously such a uh, such a terror, right. such a terror, and uh, the struggles that they had mm. uh, were in, similar to what Oppenheimer had, but I think more extreme in some ways. Right, Carla, go ahead, Tom. You know, I was going to say, you know, the even though Oppenheimer was was only in Los Alamos for two and a half years, roughly. You know, what he brought to the position is still with us today in terms of the culture of the laboratory and the commitment to free and open debate, you know, within the mm-hmm. walls, even though we're still doing sensitive work. And also, uh, you know, the importance of bringing the best technical advice 
and we recognize that there needs to be a lot of I, I recognize there needs to be a lot of voices in those discussions. Um, but one of the voices does need to be, you know, what is the science? You, the last thing you want to have is have a consequential policy debate based on a faulty understanding of the science. I'm curious what you thought of the line, if you remember it, when Oppenheimer, when I think it was one of the colleagues Oppenheimer says, you're not a scientist anymore, you're a politician. Do you feel like a politician running Los Alamos or a scientist still? So I did my research on neutron scattering, and if I bumped into a neutron in the hall now, I probably wouldn't recognize it. <laughs> um, you know, that's the, that's the role. Right. My job is to enable the science of others mm -hmm. to protect them from all these external factors that might distract them, to make mm -hmm. the case for the resources they need, and to speak truth to power even when it's uncomfortable. Carlo, do you think we'll see more scientists speak out, or do you? I mean, look, there was a chill post COVID. Look what happened at. Look at what has happened to Anthony Fauci, right? Look at what happened to Oppenheimer. I mean, you, there are a lot of parallels between Fauci and Oppenheimer, right now. I I hope there will be more scientists speaking speaking out. A lot of great physicists, of American physicists, are here in the audience. Um, let me make this comment. Um, Having weapons of mass destruction and having living in this planet, humankind thinking just about building things to kill one another and trying to dominate one another is obviously madness and stupidity. Uh, but uh, humans are not always so so mad, and there have been a lot of uh, moments in in history. Uh, think about think just about the 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 treaties about um, uh, limiting nuclear weapons that the Soviet Union and the United States were able to negotiate uh, in the moment of the, uh, of, uh, the, in the hardest moment of the Cold War with a huge ideological clash and ideological dif difference. Nevertheless, um, reasonable people in power could you know, decide to sit down. And at that point, scientists and in particular the physicists played a big role. That's what uh, Keith was referring to. There was a communication between uh, uh, American and Russian scientists uh, uh, which was uh, both culturally and also directly uh, important for, and I think that's what should happen today. I mean, the scientists for for scientists for for our world, uh, you know, the Russians are friends, the Chinese are friends, right. and I think that's what we should learn and tell the politicians stop this madness of just trying the to. The laws of physics are the, the same in China as they are in the United States, as they are in Russia. The physics is the same, are. but it's more, it's more, it's also, um, you know, one thing, one of the beautiful things we see in the movie, it's the openness of some scientists. I mean, first of all, I, I, I loved seeing Oppenheimer uh, uh, getting engaged with the West, the Wasteland, with Elliot, with, uh, uh, with, uh, uh, with the modern pictures, this, this openness, and with politics. I mean, the science is not, a close thing. It's a. Uh, it's something that talks with the rest of the culture and should talk with the rest of the right. culture and should contribute. But ultimately, the decisions are not the scientists. Ultimately, the decision is society, is politics, and that's where we need uh, to calm down the current tension and the disasters. Right. I think. Let's talk about Christopher. I could get you to do two screenings. Right. I'd have you do one screening to the U.S. Congress. What would you hope they would take away from this? I think more than anything coming out of making the film and as, as it starts to go out to the world, um, I realised that, that, we talked about this earlier, our relationship with the fear of nuclear weapons ebbs and flows with the geopolitical situation. Right. And it shouldn't because the threat is constant. And, and very often when you look back at history, some of the closest moments to nuclear disaster have actually been in times of relative calm geopolitically. So even though the situation in Ukraine kind of puts it more in people, the forefront mm -hmm. of people's minds, the truth is nuclear weapons are an extraordinarily dangerous thing to have lying around the house. And it is not something we should ever forget about, and it's not something we should take lightly. And one of the things that frightens me the most about, mm -hmm. you know, you talk about coming home from work with anxiety. But when I hear in the media people, reasonable people talking about tactical nuclear weapons, right. as if this distinction can be made and can be made via first politi politicians and media sort of warming us up to the idea that perhaps there's a, a certain size of nuclear weapon that would be acceptable as opposed to the large ones. It's kind of the, like the word clean coal. 
Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's very mean, much clean coal, tactical much. nukes. I don't think they exist. Well, and, and yeah. part of the but part of the fascination about Oppenheimer's as you dig in on his story, one of the things he did, you know, you talk about things I had to leave out of the film that are in Kai's book and mm-hmm. everything. One of the things that he did, he he was not naive. He did not get crushed by the system out of naivety. He was incredibly sophisticated. And he started talking about tactical weapons, bring the battle back to the battlefield, because he wanted to play the army off against the Air Force, essentially. He mm-hmm. wanted to temper the threat of these giant genocidal H-bombs that the Air yeah. Force wanted to have in the air 24-7. But, you know, his philo- he kept you had it, I think he reiterated a few times in the movie, and it's held true, where his belief was, well, if we use it once, it'll mean they won't use it again. So far, that's been true. So it's interesting if you yeah. – there's a, a book um, by Hariri, one of um, uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Mm-hmm. And one of the things he talks about is if you look at all of recorded and only partially recorded human history, for most of that period of time, 15% of the population died from violence, from armed conflict. Mm-hmm. Since 1945, it's been single-digit percentages. So Oppenheimer's – and Bohr's dream that war would end did not come to pass, obviously. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as, as horrific as mm-hmm. the concept of mutual assured destruction is, yeah. it has acted as a restraint. And if you ask, so far, so far, right. so fingers far. crossed. But if you ask what role is nuclear deterrence playing right now in the Ukraine, it is containing the conflict. Now, it's scary because we don't know whether or not it's going to hold. But then again, you know what also nuclear deterrence has done? It's deterred how much we help. It has exactly. deterred our ability to help Ukraine more. A- absolutely. And there's been, but, you know, why no fly zone? Because you've got to enforce it. But I would right. say we have seen what happens when wars spread across borders in Europe. Right. We saw it in 1939. We saw it in 1914. So, you know, one of my predecessors, um, uh, I think it was Norris Bradbury said the role of nuclear weapons is to force world leaders to think of other solutions to their problems. Let me – one more screening I want you to have, which is in Silicon Valley. And what do you want those guys to take away from this film? I, I think what I would want them to take away is the concept of accountability. Um, not to, to sideline the conversation to the labor disputes going on in Hollywood right now, but yeah. – a lot of it, when they're talking about things like AI, when we, we talk about these issues, they're all ultimately boil down to the same thing, which is when you innovate with technology, you have to maintain accountability. And the rise of companies over the last 15 years who bandy about the word words like algorithm, not knowing what they mean in any kind of meaningful mathematical <laughs> sense. These guys all know what an algorithm is, what it does. Right. People in my business talking about it, they just don't want to take responsibility for whatever that algorithm does. Yeah. And applied to AI, that's a terrifying possibility, terrifying. Not least because as AI systems go into the defense infrastructure, ultimately they'll be in charge of nuclear weapons. And if we allow people to say that that's a separate entity from the person who's Mm -hmm. wielding, programming, putting that AI into use, then we're doomed. It has to be about accountability. We have to hold people accountable for what they do with the tools that they have. Speaking of this stuff, you didn't use any CGI. Did not Con- use That's decision. a much lighter uh, yeah. question to answer. So <laughs> it's a, a nice well, I say of, that, but, but no, you no, didn't. No, because, I, you no, know, I didn't. And, I, and I wonder, are you going to pledge to not use CGI going forward? You don't want to be involved in generative AI. I mean, are there certain things you won't do? No, not at all. Yeah. Um, and I think that AI is already a very powerful tool in, in our business as far as visual, fe- visual effects go. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the interesting thing, as you, as you said, is computer graphics, to me, they're a touch anodyne. They're very versatile, but they tend to lack threat. Uh, mm-hmm. Of course, now they're seeming threatening in other ways. But, <laughs> but as far as your actual use of them, and, and as a filmmaker, you're trying to gauge you know, what colors are in your paint box, what techniques are you going to use, what's mm-hmm. the feeling. And so in an earlier film, at the end of, of one of my films, the, there's a nuclear explosion and Dark Knight Rises. It's meant to feel like it's far away enough that it's not going to affect Mm. you and, and, and whatever and so it's you're actually meant to have a, a sense of okay we got away with it at the end we did mm. that with cg it was beautifully rendered my team you know incredible mm. research but coming to portray the trinity test and obviously we're here you know leading up to the anniversary of the trinity test tomorrow but 
it was it was like okay this this has to feel dangerous this has to feel beautiful and terrifying in equal measure yeah. and real world imagery real world things i think they they have that that bite well i think beautiful and terrified it's a pretty good uh I think we should put out a movie poster because it was beautiful and it was terrifying congratulations thank I you i think we and we may never stop <laughs> thank you very much and what a panel thank you guys <laughs>